just to accumulate money or anything like that, really not important. Much more important to do some positive work. In Yugoslavia in 1929 has been introduced the royal dictatorship, right, and the Slovenians and the different ethnic groups have been eventually, let's say, persecuted, so that we start rebelling and eventually demonstrating when we have been very young, so that at 10, 12 of age, we have been actually already demonstrating. And then, of course, in 1935-36, practically when the Hitler uh, occupied Czechoslovakia and so on, and then uh, we have been on the street quite often, right? In '39, then I decided to go to study law. When I finished law, and I was at the court, uh, from '41 till '43, we have been occupied by the Italy. Then I decided to move away, and so I went to Trieste as the economist for the Gospodarska Zveza, that was the rural cooperative purchasing foodstuff for the. Uh, Ljubljana province. And in 1945, when uh, Tito occupied Trieste for 40 days, I moved and went to Rome and became a refugee. We had the contact with the British, right, because I was working in underground, right, during the war, and so I have been invited eventually because knew the European conditions to IRO as the eligibility officer. And my job, my main task was to interview them, to determine their bona fide status. So everybody who was declared eligible, bona fide refugees, has to go uh, to present himself to the selection committee of that particular country in which they wanted to emigrate, had to pass the medical examination. Then we organized also the transport. I was a refugee, let's say myself, and th that's the reason that also I understood. I have been in one way always, I said, I'm really privileged, right? While the other people have been in the refugee camps, means I have been paid, I was able to marry it also in that period, living privately, but I always wanted to go and to emigrate. In 1951, my wife became pregnant, and he said, Oswana, we cannot emigrate now, when that the first baby will be born and will start walking. When the first daughter start walking, I said, now time to go. She said, I'm again pregnant. <laughs> and then finally in 54, right, she said, I'm still pregnant. I said, look, <laughs> pregnant or not pregnant, we go. Dr. Carter, who was the medical officer of Australian Mission, came one to my office and he said, Mr. Hrieber, you realize that my contract will expire next year, but I would like to make you a present. You would be never accepted on the medical grant because of your eyesight, but I got a special permission from Canberra that you are welcome to Australia. And when I mentioned that to my wife, I said, forget United States, forget Canada, let's go to Australia and the large gesture that the head office in uh, Switzerland of Eichen, I have been appointed as the escort officer on the Paolo Toscanelli. So again, I had my oven cabin, right, and was basically eating, uh, eating in the dining room with the uh, officers of and the captain of the ship. I was fit, right, all, like a fish all the time, uh, so that when we came then, uh, finally in Bonagila. It was a new world. In Australia, you had that feeling of enormous freedom. You have been able to think whatever you wanted to think, talk, right? And was not like at home that once you open your mouth, then probably for one week you did not sleep because you didn't know whether somebody is going during the night knocking on the door. I worked till five o'clock, six o'clock was home, had my tea, and then my wife said, better you go to have a rest. At 10 o'clock she came, he said, Zwone, time to get up. 
And then at 10 o'clock, I went up and studied till 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning, and then back to bed, and then at 5, 6 o'clock in the morning, starting again. Professor Terry Hazelwood and then Dean Abbott walked to my office and said, we heard so much about you, would you be interested to come to the university? You have been appointed to WAGA. I said, yes, sir, <laughs> I'm looking for the house. And then we started really looking for the house and we discovered that house, which was just partly built in Mimosa Drive. And now it's, what, 2006 and I'm still here, right? In Australia, let's say, from the very first moment when I came, right, I aimed not only eventually to earn for the support of the family, but I really wanted to make some positive contribution to the community. I said, it's the freedom of this country, right, means uh, the only way how I can eventually repay the Australian generosity and they, their spirit of the freedom, it's really to contribute something. And of course, let's say, in the teaching position, I saw that opportunity that one day here in Waga, I get a telephone call from Canberra Australian Security Commission. I said, I don't have anything to do with Australian Security Commission. I said, who is speaking? I said, Mr. Heber, you don't remember me. I was one of your students. I said, of course I remember you. You have been redheaded and you play football. And one day you broke the leg on the football, uh, football game. And when you came to the class, I said, Peter, either it's accounting or it's football, one or other. I said, any particular reason that you are telephoning me from Canberra? He said, yes, as a matter of fact, it's such a glorious day and I'm just looking through the window and I'm thinking, oh, if it wouldn't be for the bloody river, I would never be here. <laughs>